AMD HBM memory. This is what we've been hearing about for a long time. We finally got the uh, the scoop on it. Uh, its stuff looks to be kind of interesting and good. We found out a few things about it that we did not know before. Uh, a lot of things have been confirmed. Namely, it's like a 1024-bit uh, bus, essentially, in between the graphics chips. There are four graphic, uh, not graphics chips, but the memory chips. There are four stacked on each other in each DRAM. And so each 2.5D interposer right now can handle up to four gigs of RAM. Uh, there's just a whole lot to it. One, you're, you're improving the amount of space because, one, the chips are stacked. They they have the TSVs the two through the through silicon vias yep which are essentially you know copper wires that go all the way through the die and connect one to the other uh, they've got the control logic on the bottom it's kind of a fifth chip so it's a very efficient way of doing it and these these chips only run at 500 megahertz just compare that to GDDR5 which is a multiple of that. Uh, it pulls less power. Uh, they're able to do things like improve latency just because it's closer to the actual memory controller without having to go through substrate, PCB, uh, the individual chip controllers and, and FIs, and all the way to the memory. You're cutting out a couple of layers there. You're increasing your overall speed because you've got a bus that's four times the width of uh, GDDR5, GDDR5, I believe, runs at 1.5 volts. These are 1.3 volts. So you've got power savings all over the place. So it's a lot more efficient. They're able to crank it up. So, for example, the uh, the R9 290X with a 512 bit bus has about 320 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Well, the first version of this one should about double that in between 500 and 620 gigabytes per second is what what people are thinking and you're doing that at lower power so this is this is kind of a disruptive technology for graphics and so far AMD is going to be the first who uh, who are doing this now interposers are not new I think Altera has been utilizing this uh, in kind of an interesting and effective way They've got an interposer, and they've got a digital chip on one half, and then an analog on the other that connected the two. And they do that because, in terms of fabrication technology, it's easier to have one or the other rather than try to combine them both into a single die that is made on a single process. So they're they're optimizing their production by uh, changing the features of the process technology. Uh, say like you know analog, you don't need the really thick oxide. Uh, was it the oxide walls? I can't remember. Uh, but for for the digital stuff, ASICs, you 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 do need the the thicker oxide. Um, so is this? Um, I'm looking at this picture here, and it looks like just one package of regular old DDR or GDDR5 is only 32 bits, like just for one chip, basically one package. Right? Correct. And so this is. 1024 bits per package. So in other words, like you're getting that out of each of those four stacks on that GPU picture we saw earlier. I guess. Yeah, right? I think so. I can't remember offhand. I mean, going off of, going off of that yeah. slide, it looks yeah. like that's the case. But then if you go back yeah, up here, yeah, I think here, that's that's correct. Each each one has you know a thousand twenty four yeah. to each, which is a ton. And if you think about why they make the silicon interposers as they do, if you were to do that through a PCB, it's just hair-raisingly hard. Right. But with an interposer, you can do that really easily because essentially they take a piece of silicon. Uh, I think the rumor has it that it's using a 65 nanometer process to actually do the litho, etch, deposition, whatnot. But the individual features on this interposer are not you know, minimum of 65 nanometers, we're talking about 100 micrometers. So Yeah, that's they're big. It's just wire. Huge. Yeah, they're yeah. essentially really, really, really fine wires. But you do that through, uh, you know, lithography and deposition and etching. And uh, it's a lot more effective, easy, efficient to do it that way. And not only that, but because the features are so large, you could do multiple exposures 
onto a die and they'll still work because, hey, let's say we're, you know, 20 nanometers off on or, or 50 or 100 nanometers off on, uh, on matching things up. Well, you're still two orders of magnitude bigger yeah. in terms of the wire. So it doesn't matter. Yeah, you're basically so drawing. Can, you're drawing very large features, right? It's like looking at a low resolution video on a high resolution display, basically, right? Like it can be a little bit yeah. off. It's you're still going to be fine, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you're you're you've got crayons and you're you're trying to color a couple of lines in something the size of Central Park. Yep. So it doesn't matter that you're a little bit off. Yeah. So in other words, you're not that worried about like you're basically you're going to get every die off of the wafer pretty much for yeah something i mean like the this, defects right? are going to be pretty low yeah. i mean you're you're going to have some that just won't work for one reason or the other and sure. that's that's just life but the chances of that happening are are pretty pretty low i think where the problem that they have is is mating all the different parts together so you've got a substrate that communicates with all the power and ground and data planes then you've got the interposer on top of that, and then you've got the individual memory dies, GPU dies, you know, any kind of ASIC die that 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 is going to be on top of that. And apparently, the interposer is incredibly thin. It's like what they they say when you hold it in the hand, in in your hand, it's it's almost like you know having a piece of paper okay. of that size. Whether or not it's flexible or somewhat, who knows? And so you've got to one make sure that's well supported. Because if you crank on a heat sink and you've got all those different dyes pushing it down, you would think that the potential of, of that thing cracking would be pretty high. So I think where the issue is that uh, and the potential yield issues is mating all those things together. So you can get that on the substrate pretty easy, but then you've got to get each one of those dyes on there that has not just 1,024 micro bumps that are your data lines – but you're also talking power and ground. Yep, so power you ground, could have address lines. Yeah, you could yep. have sixteen thousand plus micro bumps on one of these interposers, and that might even be a low number. Huh. Uh, so it's I mean, there's a ton of work going on there, and I think that's probably where you're gonna have the largest point of failure because it's still a new technology. These are very complex parts. Um, but it's gonna be kind of disruptive in terms of at least memory technology, whether or not AMD can actually produce a GPU that will be something that people want at the price that will be offered for. Uh, that's, that's, that's a question we're going to have to answer next month when things apparently get released. But right now, you know, AMD wanted to get out the word on, on the uh, HPM, and it, it looks good. On paper, looks great. But they have to implement it effectively, they have to get it out to the people, and uh, we have to see exactly how well it works. But this is the future, at least for graphics and maybe other products down the line, and it will be utilized by many other people other than AMD. In fact, NVIDIA will have an HBM product next year with uh, Pascal, and there are going to be other guys that have non-GPUs that will utilize um, just kind of the the flexible nature of a 2.5D and a, and a stacked or a 3D stacked as well um, type setup. So, I think you could pr- would, you could uh, probably make a pretty mean uh, like Intel mobile integrated GPU on the CPU with the RAM as well, like all in one thing. I bet OEMs wouldn't mind putting that in laptops, right? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I well, I, I probably can't talk about that. Oh, but okay. um, I, I went and referenced a talk. Well, a, a reader sent me a link to a talk that was done in 2012 by one of the guys at AMD. Um, I think his last name is Bleak or Black. My memory, it's it's just shot to hell. But he talked about interposers and how we went for a long time where everything is being integrated onto a die. So we had graphics, we had Northbridge, we're, we've got Southbridge, and now we've got these full SOCs. And he said the problem with that is you're slowing down the introduction of these parts because different parts require 
different things from the process node. Just as I talked about analog versus uh, digital chips, you know, RF chips have a totally different structure in how they work rather than, you know, an ASIC, which will do, you know, computations digitally. The same thing goes for different parts. I mean, memory controller has different options that need going on. The, the I.O. Uh, for the South Bridge, some things are, are you know, kind of totally different there. So he said the key to in the interposer is that you can manufacture each of the chips on a process node or that, that is more appropriate for the type of work. But you can all integrate them on this interposer and have really, really fast performance. So you've got better time to market. You've got less yield issues because you don't have you know one process trying to be the jack of all trades. Instead, you can quickly get out you know a smaller part that is more aimed at at the particular process, and then they can tweak other things in a different process to to do a different part. And so you put all those together, and they work fine on the interposer. So that obviously is a discussion that's going well past AMT HBM, but. And, and the, Intel's been doing that with the since the Haswell U part with the chipset. Yeah. Not with an interposer. It's uh, similar, but it's not an interposer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. interposers get a lot faster than, yeah. than what we have seen with, um, you know, Haswell it's like, and it's that. Like, it's like a shrunken PCB. Yeah. Well, it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a PCB that you're making with lithography. Basically. Yeah, with, with silicon. And yeah. it's going to have some features in there. Uh, the first generation HBM is going to be essentially just wires. Uh, you're not going to see things like, you know, active transistors, capacitors, whatnot on the HP, on the uh, interposer. But those are things that probably will be integrated in the future to allow even more flexibility and more interesting things that you can do with signals. So... With that, uh, HBM is an interesting technology. We're going to see it this summer, and uh, we hope that it turns out to be all it is cracked up to be. Cool. 